Some people just have great timing. Sarah Spain has great timing. Good game with Sarah Spain, all about women's sports, and you could not have picked a better time uh, to start this podcast. It's only, what, uh, eight, seven, eight, nine episodes old, right? Yeah, we started last Wednesday, so today was episode uh, 10. Unbelievable stuff. Sorry, all right. eight. Uh, episode, I, can <laughs> I can't, I can't either. Math, uh, math eluded me when I was in high school. Uh, so l- <laughs> let's, let's get to, let me, why, why don't we start with the number one story in not only women's sports, it might be the number one story in sports, uh, over the last say six months. And that's, uh, Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese, the WNBA and everything that goes around with it. I know you've, I've been, I've I've been following you on Twitter for, I don't know, a decade or so. Um, <laughs> the, so I know you have been into the game, but now yeah. everybody is getting into the game. We Television ratings for the uh, the All-Star game were two and a half times the record, uh, selling out 20,000 seat arenas. Uh, I mean, I guess it's all Caitlin Clark, but I think people have discovered that, my gosh, the game is so different. Yeah, I mean, it's Caitlin Clark in the sense that she was like an easy gateway drug because you don't need to know anything to know that logo threes are impressive, right? I mean, (laughs) it's just that simple. You don't have to know whether the other team is playing good defense. You don't have to know the name of the other team. You don't have to know what else Caitlin is good at. You don't have to know the history of the game. You can just say, I'm going to turn this on and watch this one player that's going to do amazing things that would be difficult for any basketball player on earth to do regardless of gender, level of play, et cetera. So that gets you through the door. Then once you're in there, you're like, oh, they're logo threes and they're clutch, right? She's going to hit them to win games or at the end of buzzers. And now I'm even more excited. Now I'm watching who she's playing against. Now I'm seeing a rivalry with Angel Reese. And like people underestimate how important that is because in yeah. sports, so much of that entry into it is a story to have an opinion about. Like if you look at what leads first take around the horn, major news on, on sports, it's usually something that you could pick a side. And in women's sports, that's been a really hard thing for such a long time because people didn't have enough information to decide whether they wanted to root for someone or against them, whether they were a villain or a good guy. Like in women's sports, we need all the connective tissue between the big tentpole events Mm -hmm. where we know who the stars are and what's at stake when they're playing and all that stuff. And so with Caitlin, it was like, here's something amazing. Here's something easy to understand using just highlights. And then once you're in, hopefully you'll get into the rest of it. Sarah Spain is joining us. Sarah, a good game with Sarah Spain is the podcast. Uh, episode ten uh, will drop today. By the way, you had uh, you know for years, and this is going to sound very. Co- I don't mean it to be that way. Uh, Sue Bird is yeah. the goat to me. And I, I I started what when she was at UConn. I started watching her, uh, and I'm I'm not going to like pretend that I was an avid WNBA follower, <laughs> but Sue Bird. Kind of looks like my high school girlfriend, uh, and so I have I had a crush on Sue Bird forever. Uh, but nice she, for your high school girlfriend, <laughs> Sue Bird's a good-looking gal. Well, she was. Uh, I, I assume still is. Uh, and we went to the <laughs> prom. To I've told this story. I've told this story for a, a few times. We went to the prom, and the day of the prom, we played one on one, and she kicked my rear end. Uh, oh yeah, she, I got. Uh, I think I scored twice um, in in the basketball game. That is that's another story altogether. <laughs> uh, Sarah Spain is joining us here, but we, you know, you talk about when you get in, and then you you find other things. Like again, not being an avid viewer of the WNBA during the uh, you know in past years, I started watching, and all of a sudden I realized, how does anybody stop Asia Wilson? <laughs> right, right. That's one of the best parts of this kind of. There's a lot of frustration around some of the new fans, and I think honestly, some of the veteran fans are gatekeeping too. So that's made for sort of some tense beginnings to this season. It's kind of settled down a little, and we're talking basketball. Uh, which is good because some of these new people showing up, I think might have had an old school idea of what the game looked like, or maybe didn't have any idea. Right. And so the level of play is outstanding. And Asia Wilson in particular is having a season unlike any other. Like if you talk to every single analyst and expert, um, she is not only hands down leading the way for MVP, but defensive player of the year as Mm -hmm. well. And I don't believe there's ever been a unanimous MVP as in everybody put one person at number one because you rank them um, with your votes. Um, And 
you know, I, I don't see anyone in the second half of the season being able to bring it enough to slow Asia down. Um, so barring injury or anything wild, um, she's having perhaps the greatest season we've ever seen in the WNBA. She's a cheat code. I mean, that's yeah, all like pretty much. <laughs> she's playing at a different speed than everybody else. The, the, the only drawback, and maybe it's not a drawback because it, be, it became conversation and ultimately that's good, was how polarizing Clark, Reese, the Olympics, uh, the, the, the coach, all of, all of that created conversations that were some, in some ways unsavory and there was a race yeah. element to it. Uh, For but sure. in the, but in the end we were talking about it and watching it and maybe in the long run, it was a good thing. But what was, yeah. what was, what was sure. your take on Clark versus Reese when Reese said, Hey, people come to watch me too. I agreed with her. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, she's got like over 4 million fans. She's got <laughs> real famous rappers, singers, actresses, everybody coming courtside or saying they want to. She's at the Met Gala. You know, she's right. got endless sponsor deals. Like she, I think it's fair when she feels a little bit miffed when people are like, it's just Caitlin. And she's like, okay, what, what about the 4 million people that are right. following me and watching me? Um, I think ultimately, yes, it was good. Because again, you need to have something to elevate it the national conversation besides just the game. We know that even with men's sports, that it's not just who had the better game. It's all the different debates you can have about who should start and get cut and yada, yada. But also I think what's been fascinating is how, because of some of the worst conversations, we're (laughs) able to have immediate in-person examples of some of the stuff that's plagued women's sports for decades. One of them is that people don't seem to be able to separate being women from everything that they know about sports. So there's, actual professional men's players saying that the rest of the NBA should take it easy on Caitlin early on and let her score a bunch because it'd be good for the league. In what universe would you ever think that about sports? Like, literally the point is to win. Literally what we love about it is that it's a meritocracy. It's like, if I do the best, I win. You know, unless someone's cheating. Shout out Canada. <laughs> but um, you know what I mean? And so, like, it's weird. It's like people forget everything they know and get so weird around women. And it's like, nah, like, or the, the physicality of it. Yeah. Oh, everybody hates her. Everybody hates her, and that's why they're jealous. And it's like, watch a game. Like, watch it. Let me put together a highlight reel for you of people getting clocked in the head and how physical the play is. It's sports. Right. And I, I think having those conversations actually might help us going forward to sort of demystify the idea that like women want to kick each other's butts too. Right. <laughs> well, you, you, they they don't just want to be uh be you know be friends and no, we I... don't just want to be friends and we don't just want to like let a rookie win. Like I just some of those takes from the average person, I was like, okay, you've never been in the locker room, you know, touch grass. But the professional athletes who yeah. somehow. Because it's women, they lose the entire perspective that they've had their whole lives about sports. It's really weird. But I'm glad we talked about it because we could call them out and be like, let's stop doing this. <laughs> yeah, I remember watching episodes of First Take and like Monica McNutt and, and they're going at, kind of going at Stephen A, which is, I think, yeah. good for good. Uh, for that yeah. show. And Monica's like, yeah, we're talking about competitiveness. That's what, what, <laughs> why are we, yeah. why are we complaining about this? These are incredible athletes, and they want to win, and they're just being competitive. Uh, There are no drones, I guess, inside WNBA (laughs) arenas. Sarah Spain, at Sarah Spain on Twitter. Good game with Sarah Spain. Before I get into some other sports stuff, uh, what was behind the name Good Game? Is there an an underlying meaning to that? Well, so I wanted to call it The Good Place because that's how I feel about particularly right. women's sporting events, like people who get to an Angel City game, a U.S. Women's National Team, a New York Liberty game, like all these women's sporting events, they're like really struck by the vibe. And it's all the stuff you love about sports, minus the like drunken people fighting. <laughs> and even at Angel City, they've got a whole level of the stadium that basically they turn into a bar after the game ends. So no matter where you were sitting at the game, you go to this section and they they keep serving drinks and everyone in the stadium who wants to hang out and meet each other can. So it feels very like social and yeah, you want your team to win, but everybody's like vibing. It's a, it's very different than the average and no one's like too cool for school. Um, So I wanted to name it that, but there's obviously a TV show and you know, SEO search engine wise, we weren't sure it was going to get to the top. 
So then I was trying to think of something else that got that vibe. Like, I'm going to be critical when I need to. I'm going to be talking about some challenges in women's sports when I need to. But I think too much of the coverage ends up being about that and not about being fun. Right. And for me, like, if you're on, for instance, social media and you're following all the athletes and the teams and whatever, you recognize how much fun women's sports are mm-hmm. and how much good stuff there is. So it's like... Why don't we do more of that in the shows, too? Why is all of our coverage about how we don't have resources and that we're not getting covered and whatever? So I want it to be good. And so I thought about the end games when you're like, good game, good game, good game with the hand flaps. Um, It also allowed me the opportunity to include an FU because we all know that that's the same thing that happens. It's good game, good game, good game. And then FU to the people that we don't like. And some of those people get shouted out in the show, too. Sarah Spain is joining us here on the Adam Gold Show. So which of, was it Trinity Rodman or Sophia Smith who did the TikTok with a fan uh, at one of the lead-up, uh, you know, uh, tune-up Trinity. matches? Trinity? Trinity is the queen of TikTok dances. She is uh, for a, a, <laughs> an amazing player. Her trin spin yeah. uh, yesterday. yesterday. My Ooh. gosh, first goal. So the, uh, there's a lot of pressure on the women's team because they were – you know, for years and years, runaway number one ranked in the world. Now they're fifth. It's kind of hard to believe yeah. that the women's national team is fifth ranked uh, in FIFA women's rankings. Um, but they they do seem to be a lot different. I think uh, the transition was more difficult to this new generation of players than maybe they gave it credit. And they were hurt at the World Cup last time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's, it's cool. And the rest to- of the world catching up you know it's yeah. not just the fifth ranking you know the u.s haven't won olympic gold since 2012 which is wild and last year's world cup was their worst finish ever um they're not a bad team but what they could do before was capitalize on their athleticism and the depth of their talent pool yeah against other countries particularly that don't have the benefits of title nine don't have the benefits of um, structured sport for women the same way now that other countries, it, it's kind of like Tiger Woods. We always used to say Tiger Woods, by the end of his career, was playing against the people that he inspired to play golf. Yep. So it was like he had created his own problems. Serena Williams, the same way. If you clear a path and you show to others what can be, eventually they'll catch up and try to take the mantle. And the U.S. Women's National Team, not only their play, but also their equal pay fight, inspired federations all across the world to try to get better out of their own um, soccer federations. So they're ultimately playing against teams that they helped build. And all these countries now have a lot more talent, a lot more depth, a lot more people to choose from. And tactically, they're extremely good. And so Emma Hayes arriving is really good for the U.S. Women's National Team because they need to tactically catch up because they can't just rely on athleticism and depth anymore. I'll go back to the, the women's Euros a couple of years ago, which opened the eyes in on that continent yeah. Because they, they yeah. didn't they didn't think it would be that big a deal. They had most of the matches scheduled for smaller stadiums, and then all of a sudden they were putting you know sixty thousand people at Wembley, uh-huh. uh, and they went wait you know a what? second. And now the resources are there. Yeah, you know what's fascinating about that, and it's a perfect I think example to use when you're talking about the growth of women's sports or what's held them back. A lot of people have really believed that it's just that the product isn't very good and people don't want to watch. But you look at something like soccer in England. They banned women's professional soccer for 70 years. Mm -hmm. They banned it. It was intentional. There was a game where the women outdrew the men by tens of thousands of fans. The male soccer federation was angry, and they put an end to women's professional soccer and stunted the growth for 70 years. So, like, without that context, people really think, oh, they just figured it out. (laughs) No. Like, they had to recover from the intentional holding back of women's sports. And like, that is so true across so many spaces. So I think, you know, those of us that love it and have known the product has been great. We really want the context there too. So that people don't believe it's just like, Oh, finally it's the product's good enough. No, it's been good enough. Yeah. The, uh, it, it's amazing. I, I love at least the first 25 minutes of, uh, yesterday's match were great. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, they kind of slept through the rest of it, but hopefully they'll continue to improve. And it is a new regime, Emma Hayes, uh, and a whole host of super young players, Sarah Spain yeah. at Sarah Spain on Twitter. Good game with Sarah Spain is the podcast. I hope you'll come back. I thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I'll figure out my math before next time I come on. No, nothing advanced. <laughs> 
There'll be a quiz. I'll be able to count eight shows. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for having me.